Farming has changed over the years, and sometimes accepted farming practices conflict with neighbors or the public, and that causes some tension. Should the legislature step in? Next on Show Me Ag. Welcome to Show Me Ag. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Thanks for joining us. Last spring, the Missouri Legislature passed a bill calling for a statewide vote on what some call the Right to Farm Law. The governor vetoed it, but the legislature recently overrode the veto, and the issue will be on the ballot next November. You'll hear a lot about it in the next year, but we're going to give you a head start. Our guest tonight is a former legislator and lieutenant governor of Missouri who has taken a different turn from public office to farming, practicing law, and representing the Humane Society of the United States. This has caused some controversy, but that's never bothered my guest from Mexico, Missouri, Joe Maxwell. Joe, thank you for coming. Thank you, Kyle. Tell Appreciate us, being here. Well, we're glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about the history of this bill and how that's evolved. Well, there's actually two bills kind of tied up that uh, I think the citizens ought to at least be aware of and be concerned about. Um, first was uh, House Joint Resolution uh, 7 and 11. That uh, resolution that passed uh, refer it will allow for a referendum, as you indicated, November of 2014. Uh, that has been termed the right to farm. I would really want everybody to drill down on that and make sure they understand what that means. Right to do what should be what is going through their minds. And then also there was the legislation which was uh, uh, Senate Bill 9 in which there was legislation or an amendment placed into that that would allow the foreign ownership of land in, in the state of Missouri. Uh, up to 1%, and then after 1% of the farmlands owned by foreign corporations, uh, uh, then uh, the director of ag would have the ability to allow more land to be owned, uh, Missouri farmland to be owned by foreign corporations. The governor vetoed that provision, and then the uh, legislature just recently overrode the governor. So when you put these two issues together, I think the, the, what we need to ask ourselves is, do we want uh, companies like or the Chinese have just purchased Smithfield, uh, Smithfield owns 50,000 acres of Missouri farmland along with the uh, premium standard farms and the CAFOs up in North Missouri. Uh, what we'd be saying if the citizens would go yes on the referendum November four, uh, 14, they would be saying you can do whatever you want uh, to the neighbors uh, around, uh, around that part of Missouri. So we do think that those two issues together need to be carefully looked at and thought through by the citizens about what we're really doing. Who are we really turning over the, uh, the rights uh, to build, to operate in Missouri. It, it seems like to me that the legislature normally doesn't step in unless there's some sort of problem that they want to attempt to cure, or sometimes that doesn't work. Has there been a problem? Have farmers been uh, somehow restricted from what they want to do? Well, the first thing, I, I don't know what, I'm a farmer. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think that in Missouri we have some very lenient laws as compared to other states and what you can do on your farm. Sometimes I've even thought a little too lenient. Uh, you know, I, I own my farm. Sometimes I ask myself, why should the neighbor across the way be able to build a, a large confinement and then I have to wake up every morning and not have my windows open in the springtime or the fall because of the air quality uh, that comes around those huge animal uh, feedlots and the confinement buildings that the hogs are kept in or chickens or turkeys. So Missouri is not known for having restricted it. So there is a big question about whether there should even be a need to have a right to farm bill in Missouri. I, I would suggest not. Well, as we already mentioned, the organization behind this is called Missouri Farmers Care. And this is a coalition between a, a joint effort by Missouri's farming and agriculture community who, as they describe, stand together for the men and women who provide the food and jobs on which our community depends. Missouri Farmers Care is made up of 44 organizations, uh, primarily agriculture from rural parts of the state. Uh, that's doubled from 22 in the last two years. We have some really big members people be familiar with, like uh, Missouri Farm Bureau, MFA Incorporated, all the way down to uh, some local grain elevators across the state. Our, our purpose is to promote the continued growth of rural Missouri and agriculture through coordinated communication, education, and advocacy. That's actually our mission statement. Well, what led to the formation of Missouri Farmers Care is kind of the ag groups noticed that there's a growing disconnect between the consumer and the producer, and that's why we have a lot of education programs 
And what that leads to on the policy side is a lot of misunderstanding between uh, voters in urban and suburban areas and voters in rural areas. And you really saw that divide on the Proposition B vote. And uh, animal rights groups, anti-agriculture groups have kind of uh, exploited this divide to push their agenda and, and try to leverage that against agriculture. And we're kind of tired of being on defense. We've been on defense multiple times on some of these ballot initiatives. And the idea with Right to Farm is to do something that's positive and proactive that, that protects us before the problem happens rather than us having to respond to the problem later. Yeah, on the policy side, our big issue right now is the Farming Rights Amendment, also called the Right to Farm Amendment, HJR 7 and 11, which is a referendum that went through the state legislature in this, uh, this last session, which means voters will ha actually have the chance to vote on that to put that, the right to farm in the state constitution next year. The Right to Farm Act is a uh, constitutional amendment that will be voted on next November at the general election. And uh, it will be uh, an amendment that will uh, give the, uh, the farmers the right to farm, basically, ensure that is protected by the Constitution of the Missouri, state of Missouri. Missouri farmers have been under attack uh, from anti-agriculture and, and uh, animal activist groups over the last few years, uh, basically coming outside of Missouri, coming into the state of Missouri, telling us that, okay, you need to farm a certain way. And uh, it's not, uh, not anything proven scientifically, it's just their, their emotional uh, uh, thoughts on how we need to farm. So this was important that we put this together and get this into the Constitution to protect farmers into the future from, from those type of groups. What we're trying to do with the Right to Farm Amendment is give agriculture some type of legal basis to go to the state Supreme Court in the future if there's ever a specific act that's outlawed, if there's something that targets a, an entire sector of agriculture or targets farmers and essentially tries to put them out of business. This gives us a legal basis to go to the courts and say, we have this right to farm and you can't just put an entire industry out of business. That sounds kind of crazy, but we've actually seen that happen in states like Florida and Arizona where uh, hog farming has essentially been ended. Um, and it, it targeted just a handful of farmers because obviously that's not, a, that's not a big part of the economy in those states. But it's kind of a template that we've seen the animal rights groups use that they would like to move to more ag heavy states like Missouri. Well, I think when, uh, when uh, the, the farm groups looked at this uh, and, and the farmers looked at this, we all, uh, we were very much concerned that someone could come in and tell us how to farm. And, uh, you know, we're constantly uh, uh, looking at new, new ways to farm and, and uh, you know, controlling the uh, soil erosion and, and we're taking very good care of our animals. Uh, but having someone else come in uh, to, to tell us to do that uh, may not be the proper way to, to take care of that animal or to pr protect our soil. So uh, we feel like uh, we, we have the ability, have the knowledge and have the, uh, the help to uh, do that on our own and not, not have outside groups come in to tell us how to, how to farm and, 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 and really could, it could increase the cost of food production uh, with, with some of these regulations that, that they want to put in place. When we as row crop farmers, corn, soybean farmers, you know, our number one uh, customer is, is animal agriculture. Uh, that's where, where our product goes to. Uh, especially in the soybeans, uh, uh, hogs, cattle, uh, poultry all eat soybean meal. So it's, it's very important that we have a strong, uh, strong animal uh, agriculture base in this country to, uh, uh, to support our industry. Uh, and that's one reason that we decided that we in the soybean industry and corn industry needed to get on board on this because we needed to help those folks out because we need to protect, uh, not only protect their industry, but it, it protects all of agriculture. The people that are uh, opposed to this, uh, this amendment say it's just going to basically help corporate farms and they can abuse and the soil and the animals any, any way they want to, but, but there's uh, over 90% of the production in this country and in this state are from family farms and uh, we care very much about uh, our farms. I mean, we live on our farms. Uh, we drink the water off our farms. Uh, so we, we're very careful about how we, how we take care of, of, uh, of our animals and of our land. Uh, so I don't, I don't believe there's any, any reason to believe that there would be a, a abuse by anyone. Uh, 
because anyone that raises animals or raises uh, grain has to use the best standards possible or they will not stay in business. You know, my honest answer is this is going to help small farmers more than it's going to help corporations because the thing about the corporations is they have the resources to move their operation to another state or even another country. They have the resources and the legal counsel to fight these kind of things on their own. It's really the average Missouri farmer, with, you know, the average Missouri farm is about 200 acres. Uh, the average cattle herd is, I think, un definitely under 50. That's the kind of person that really needs the right to farm. They're the person that needs the legal support. It's not the, the corporate farms, just they just don't need it. Well, I think the right to farm amendment to the Constitution is going to have a, have a real positive uh, outcome for the consumer because it does protect the consumer uh, in, the, in the grocery aisles as far as the volume of food that's there because the Missouri farmers are the ones that produce that food. And you know, in, this, in these trying e economic times, uh, it also uh, prevents uh, some food inflation because of the fact it does protect Missouri's number one industry, agriculture. So I think those are a couple of points that, that, that are, are very important when we look at this, this uh, uh, amendment uh, because of the uh, protection that it does give to the consumer that, for, that uh, consumes our food. If you'd like to learn more about Missouri Farmers Care and their efforts, you can visit their website at the address below. This seems like a pretty complicated issue. Let, let's go back a little bit. What is it that you think farmers are, are being protected from? What would they be protected from under this law? Well, first, I, I don't know of a need in Missouri today. Um, the other side probably can describe protection. As a, as a producer in Missouri, I don't feel like I need to be protected other than from uh, the very things this will allow. The problem with this legislation that the citizens will be allowed to vote on in November 14 is that it will do away with the protections uh, to our groundwater, the Clean Water Act. It will do away with basic protections on our air quality, on the air standards. It will allow uh, individuals, corporate agriculture, uh, to come in and to be able to build very large confinements next to my property. And lower my property value. In other states where we've seen the advancement of industrialized agriculture in a large way, uh, we see that when they build a CAFO, a, a confined animal feeding operation, uh, that that individual farmer maybe has wealth, but what about the neighbors? Well, the neighbors see their property values deteriorate and go down. So I always like to ask a farmer who says, well, let's advance this, I should have a right to do this on my farm. What about my rights? What about your neighbors? What about the water? What about the land? Uh, so I see this as being something that really protects the corporate agriculture model that allows them to expand even more into the state of Missouri with assurances that they can do whatever they want. And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can build large confinements, cage and crate animals, uh, destroy the environment doesn't mean we should be able to do that. I'm a good steward of my farm uh, and, and the land and the animals. And I worry that uh, uh, this clearly would allow individuals to not have to care about those things. For a while in Missouri, we had a, a ban on foreign ownership. We had a ban on corporate farming, which right. was lifted originally in three counties to allow right. premium standard farms to, to come in. Now, uh, the premium standard went through a couple of iterations and different ownership, and now we have Chinese ownership of, of uh, Smithfield Farms. That's exactly right. The, the pattern on these type of laws is to protect corporate agriculture. They're designed to allow the industrialized ag model to grow and flourish in spite of the rights of the neighbors, in spite of how animals are cared for or how the land's cared for. Uh, you mentioned uh, it was back in the early 90s when uh, the legislature, I was in the legislature, allowed for an exemption in the corporate ag laws and we saw premium standard farms, uh, I think it's number four in the country on production, uh, build out and, and go to North Missouri. If you want to see what can happen if this passes, Drive up to the premium standards area. Talk to those neighbors. Terry Spence, a good friend of mine, has been fighting these issues all of his life. See how the land values deteriorated. They didn't go up. This wasn't a positive economic opportunity for the area. And with this, if this would pass, the citizens need to understand that it really allows for the advancement of the, of the things that uh, I believe are just in the wrong direction when it comes to agriculture. It's interesting to me that this is an effort to put on the ballot 
a law to protect farmers, but a couple of years ago we had something uh, had to do with uh, raising a, uh, I'll call it the puppy mill bill, yep, but okay. that's the shorthand version, which the state voted on, the voters of the state passed, but then the legislature sort of overrode the, the statewide vote. Absolutely. You know, uh, this would also affect uh, that law. Uh, the raising of puppies in the state of Missouri is an agricultural uh, practice. It's governed by the Department of Ag. Uh, and the citizens did vote for Proposition B, which said there ought to be certain standards for the way in which uh, dogs are raised, which puppies are, are raised in the state of Missouri. They, they ought to have certain uh, standards of care. So the veterinarian care, the way in which they're housed, whether or not they get access to exercise, the citizens agreed and voted on that. And the very next year, the legislature's back in unwinding that on behalf of agriculture. As a matter of fact, that's when Missouri Farmers Care was created, was to begin to work against Proposition B. And again, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can cage an animal and, and uh, not provide it adequate care doesn't mean you should be able to do that. This, this, if this would pass, does erase the laws and protections as it relates to puppies, as it relates to the way in which we're going to raise uh, animals in confinements, uh, the CAFOs, how, how the uh, groundwater will be treated, how, how the air quality will be done. So we really need to take a serious look at it and ask ourselves, what kind of farming and agriculture do we want in Missouri? Should we not have certain reasonable standards and how that uh, practice and industry will be done. In the past, the DNR, the Department of Natural Resources, and EPA cooperates. We've got some pretty significant regulations for uh, animal agriculture. What would the DNR role be here under under this constitutional amendment? Would that supersede a role of the DNR in trying to regulate these operations? If, if in the event that this would pass, then the Constitution uh, trumps regulations. It trumps state statutes so that the current laws that are on place are in jeopardy of being taken away. So the safeguards that over time we have implemented to protect the neighbors, to protect our groundwater, to protect the air quality, uh, are in jeopardy if, the, if this would pass. Because the Constitution is the people's law, as we would say, and I clearly believe that the people should not put this into the law. We, we need to really take a serious look at, at where we're going when it comes to this kind of uh, uh, implementation within the Constitution. Well, one of the things that happened with Proposition B, the Humane Society of the United States came in and, and kind of promoted this. Uh, that caused a lot of controversy. That's right. Uh, and and uh, we even had uh, some, some publicity uh, from, from public figures that you know, were promoting us, so it passed, Prop B passed. That really caused a scare uh, amongst some ag groups that the Humane Society of the United States would come in and, and be involved. And now you, you've gone to work for the Humane Society. This has caused some uh, uh, issues here with your neighbors. <laughs> yeah, and well, when I was in the legislature, Kyle, I worked with the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, I helped uh, work uh, to eliminate cockfighting. Missouri used to allow us to put uh, strap these devices on the, the legs of uh, roosters and watch them slice each other to death in a pen and we call that a sport. I worked with the Humane Society of the United States to eliminate that as a practice, as a sport in Missouri, a blood sport. I worked with the uh, Humane Society on other issues. So I've worked with the Humane Society when I was elected in Missouri's legislature. I had a very strong track record with animal welfare issues. I believe, I, I come at this from a faith perspective. I believe that we have a responsibility. We have all the power in the equation over all of this creation to include over the animals. And just because we have that power doesn't mean we should be able to exhibit it in any way in which we want to. Uh, the Humane Society has over uh, uh, 100,000 constituents in this state. There's a state director, a good friend of mine by the name of Amanda Good, that lives in Missouri, is from Missouri, and, uh, and is their state director. So it's not some organization coming from the outside coming in. We have a, there's a state council here of key members in the Humane Society that helps set the standards. So the Humane Society of the United States, while it is a national organization, it has members here in Missouri that are setting the pace for what should be done or not done when it comes to the, to the relationship of us with our animals. Well, in, in reading from the farm press, the Humane Society of the United States is akin to, I don't know, the, the devil, uh, I don't know what, it, it really feared, uh, and, and they feel like they're really out to get animal agriculture. 
They're in, in line with PETA, which is right. another organization that really scares folks. What's the Humane Society really like? Well, I, well they're very open, very honest, very transparent. Uh, I, like I said, I'd worked with them for years in the legislature, so I have a long experience with them, not just the time I've gone to work for them. Um, they, they have a, an attitude that we ought to have dialogue. We ought to work through these issues. I think the gentleman that was on the, the, the farmer uh, with his green John Deere combine, I congratulate them. And he's right. Most farmers, we care about our animals. I think he's just a soybean and corn grower. But, I mean, those that, of us that are livestock producers, we care about our animals. But there are some people that don't. And industrialized agriculture does not respect these animals. Right now, there's almost 4 million sows in the United States that have 2 foot by 7 foot cage is their life, all of their adult life. There are 290 million laying hens in America that live, Kyle, and I know that people can't probably see this, but they live in a space that's only as big as that. Now, I'm a farm boy, and I'll tell you, that's just raw. And I don't care, it's, we only have one earth. We, we only have one shot at we're, if we're going to destroy this earth or not. It's just wrong to pollute it. Look at the overuse of antibiotics in the production of animal livestock. We have a good friend who his boar tusked him and he almost died because the use of the an overuse of antibiotics on his farm caused an antibiotic resistant bacteria that almost killed him. Our public health is in jeopardy. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Not allowing for reasonable restrictions on the way in which we farm. Not because that farmer that was on this film earlier or video is a bad guy or I am, but there are those individuals in the industry that need to be regulated. If this passes, those regulations are in jeopardy and, and they'll be able to do whatever they want to on our farm. Some of my friends in the animal industry would say, and I've raised cattle, but some people would say, well, it's a vegetarian agenda. They want to do away with animal agriculture. Is you, You've got some friends that are in the Humane Society, what's, what's their take on that? Are they, are they all wanting us to be vegetarians? No. Uh, what we do want, and I agree with, we, we have ag councils around the country. There's other farmers beside myself working with HSUS. Um, Kevin Fulton uh, is our chairman of the ag council in Nebraska, and he says that on his farm every day is a good day except that last day when the animal goes to slaughter. <laughs> He's been on these factory farms. He says every day of their life is the bad day. The only good day they have is when they're finally put out of their misery. Uh, so uh, HSUS has farmers like myself uh, around the country. I just left Denver yesterday. I've been working in Denver with ranchers. We're going. We have a young farmers program out there. We're going. We're working with uh, a young FFA student. We're going to have a new hog farmer in Colorado very soon that HSUS is helping promote. So that 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 idea that they're just a vegan vegetarian organization, even though there are a lot of good vegans uh, uh, that are out there working with us to try to drive uh, good quality agriculture. It's not that kind of a relationship. One of the things that we've done in agriculture is we allow the industrialized ag boys and girls to come in and point to the Humane Society or the Sierra Clubs, the environmentalists, and we say, there's your enemy. Well, all the time, it's their policies that are driving us off the farm. Since I started farming, there are 91% fewer hog farmers in America. There were over 670,000 hog farmers in the United States when I started farming. Last census said there was only 67,000 left in the country. 90% are gone. 90% are gone. There's fewer uh, cattlemen, fewer dairymen. July of this year, a report out of Wisconsin said 600 fewer dairymen in Wisconsin cows stay the same number. As we corral, we're driving the farmers off the land with these policies and caging and crating the animals in severe confinement. That's the policy uh, that will be furthered if this would pass. You mentioned uh, earlier, as, as a part of the Humane Society, uh, how, how do you intend to fight this? Are, are you going to have a full scale? Well, the Humane Society of the United States is taking a look at it. What we're asking the citizens to do is take a look at it. It's your state. We have membership here. I'm sure they'll have opinions. I'm a member of the Humane Society of the United States. I obviously have an opinion. I'm a member of the state council here for the Humane Society of the United States. We're saying take a serious look at it. Don't just believe us. Take a look at it. Talk to your neighbors. Think about what you want to have happen in agriculture in the state of Missouri.
That's what we're asking for today. There, there's a, be roughly another year, there'll be a lot to, to be heard about this over the next year right. before this comes to, to a vote. Will there be some changes in the legislature this year that are going to point to this, or is it is that a done deal? This is a done deal. It will be on the ballot November the, in November 14, and citizens, what we're saying as a Humane Society of the United States is think about it. It's not what it says on its face. We, the citizens of Missouri, trust America's family farmers, poll after poll. I'm a family farmer. My brother and I farm. You farm. I'm wanting to tell the people of Missouri, this isn't about the faces of the American farmer and rancher. This is about industrialized ag and what they're going to be able to do or not do in this state. Thank you, Joe, for coming. I appreciate it. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for tonight, but I'd like to say thanks again to Joe Maxwell for being with us. And thanks to Dan Kleinsorge and Neil Bredehoff for allowing us to visit with them as well. And before we go, we'd also like to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Ag. We hope you'll tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at KMOS and myself, good night.